Life in the Universe today with Dr. Sarah Amari Walker. Sarah Walker, an astrobiologist and theoretical physicist interested in the origin of life and discovering alien life on other worlds. She is deputy director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts in Science and a professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. She's also a fellow of the Ber Berguin Institute, I always mispronounce his name, yeah. and a member of the external faculty of the Santa Fe Institute, where they study complexity and chaos theory and all that good stuff. She's a recipient of the Stanley L. Miller Early Career Award for her research on the origin of life, and her research team at ASU is internationally regarded as being among the leading labs aiming at building a fundamental theory for understanding what life is. Her research has been featured in Scientific American, Quanta Magazine, and a variety of other international outlets. Here's the new book, Yay. Life as No One Knows It, rather than Life as We Know It, The Physics of Life's Emergence. So beautiful. It'll be out August 6th. We'll release this probably on that date that the book comes out. Sarah, nice to see you. Thanks for coming on. Nice to see you too, Michael. It's really fun. I should tell people how we met. So because it was an interesting uh, yeah. coincidence. I had back-to-back -back conferences this spring, one at the Dialogue Conference, which is a little bit like TED without TED Talks, <laughs> uh, and it's not as well-known, but it was in Tucson. And uh, and then like two weeks later, I met uh, invited to this conference hosted by Peter Thiel in Florence, uh, Florence Italy, with a bunch of intelligent design theorists, uh, one of which, or so, several arguments of which have to do with the origins of life. So when I arrived at Dialogue, I was thinking, I really need to give some thought to the origins of life research. I haven't looked at this in years. I know I'm going to be peppered by these guys with, you know, you can't explain this origin of life problem, ergo intelligent design <laughs> arguments are sound, and there is a God, and so on and so forth. And so th the first night before the conference even started, at the dinner, we're plopped down at this big table with... Uh, uh, I don't know, 10 people or so, and we're just dialoguing. So the person on my left, I was like, oh, so what do you do? And it's you. <laughs> and you're like, I do origins of life research. I'm like, oh my God, the universe does actually make things happen for a reason. <laughs> so that's our little backstory there. Yeah. I was delighted to meet you and, and uh, read your book because I, I this is one of the great puzzles. You know, there's why is there something rather than nothing, the origins of the universe, consciousness, the hard problem of consciousness, the origins of consciousness, uh, free will and determinism, and then whether there's a God or not, kind of all wrapped up in that. And then your field. I mean, this is one of the half dozen most important questions anybody could ask. Yes, uh, it sure is. And I think uh, it was a bit of a cosmic coincidence that we met. But it's actually funny, as you were talking, you mentioned intelligent design theorists. And I was thinking, are there any intelligent design experimentalists? And I haven't met one. <laughs> no, they don't do experiments. What they do is largely troll through articles by people like you and say, look, they have not explained the origins of life because of X, Y, and Z. Ergo, yeah. uh, as far as I know, they don't actually conduct their own research. Yeah, I think that was part of my point. It was <laughs> a little bit of a joke about it. If they had yeah. an ID experimentalist, they might be able to solve something. But um, but yeah, it's cool. Um did you did you learn anything? <laughs> well, so one of the things that comes to mind on these things, a little bit like some of the other hard problems, like the hard problem of consciousness, if you go, mm -hmm. that's a point I made to Christoph Koch in a recent podcast episode, if you go to the Wikipedia page, there's like 12 different theories. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so the analogy I make is, well, you know, we have the Big Bang Theory and, you know, its, it's competitor, the steady state theory was outed decades ago. That's the one that won. If there's 12 different theories, it tells me, an outsider, you guys haven't figured this out yet, right? And I think the origins of life problem is something like that. There's half a dozen different theories or mm -hmm. however you want to configure it, but you don't really know yet, right? Yeah, that's right. I think, uh, and I think embracing the fact that we don't know is okay um, because those are usually the most important questions at the frontier of science. And saying you don't know the answer is the first step to finding an answer. Whereas if we assume we know it, then I think we're we're dead in the water because there's nothing new to discover. Yeah, right, exactly. So um, book title, Life as No One Knows It. Okay, so maybe we need to start there. What is life before we figure out how it originated? Yeah, well, this is actually how I started on this path. I started working the origin of life as a graduate student. And I think the thing that was most perplexing to me about that problem was we didn't understand the difference between non-living and living matter. 
And most of the people working on the problem weren't really confronting that issue. They were assuming a definition for life, and then they were looking for some chemistry, some very simple chemistry that supported that definition, whether it was, you know, life is about genetic heredity or life is about metabolism. They would look at, you know, how do I make simple uh, RNA building blocks prebiotically or how do I make amino acids? But of course, this is the issue that there's a huge complexity gap between what prebiotic chemists do and what we would deem as living cells. And it was really that sort of dichotomy between those two scales of complexity and regimes of evolutionary potential that I got really interested in, like, how do we actually think about what life is? Um, and it, it it seemed to me that defining life was kind of hopeless <laughs> because, you know, everybody in the field had come up with their pet definition of life and no, nobody was really making any headway. Um, and my training in theoretical physics really suggested to me that if you really want to make headway on these kind of hard questions, looking at more universal principles is the way to go. And if we could find a deeper universal explanation for life, we might be able to, you know, eventually derive a definition, but that definition, you know, might be very counterintuitive and not exactly where we started. But that's very, you know, consistent with the history of physics, where anytime we find any kind of broad new regularity or universal thing that describes a lot of the way the world works, like gravity or motion or um, even quantum mechanics, it really changes the way that we perceive the world or we come to understand it. And so I think understanding life and how evolution constructs complexity and all of these kinds of problems is going to lead to really new understanding. What's the textbook definition of life and why don't you like it? <laughs> yeah, the textbook, uh, it, well, the, the textbook has many defi different definitions, but my least favorite definition is the one that sort of, um, you know, NASA, it, it's like quoted as being the official NASA definition, but NASA is good. They don't actually have an official definition, but it's life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Um, and I don't like it because I feel like every single word in there is wrong, but also people use that as sort of a guiding principle for designing origin of life experiments. And I think that they have too much design in them. So um, so I think there's there's an issue of putting the cart before the horse with, with these kind of definitions that they're, they're too... They're too narrowly specific on some features of biology on Earth and not broad enough to actually encapsulate how you emerge biology in the first place. Mm. Um, so a virus would be what then by that definition? And how would by you By that deal definition, with it? I guess a virus is not alive because people would not consider it to be self-sustaining. And in fact, you can think of a lot of, of boundary cases. So you had Carl Sagan on the, the cover of Skeptic, and he had this wonderful... Um, essay on defining life, uh, where he goes through all the sort of different definitions, whether it's the metabolic different definition, the genetics definition, the sort of, you know, far from equilibrium definition. And, um, you know, I think it was something like life is something that eats, metabolizes, excretes, you know, like just, he had like seven canonical phrases you might see in an introductory biology textbook. But, you know, he concluded that many of these features are um, present in machines that nobody wants to call alive and absent from things that people do want to call alive. So he's really pointing out this this issue that anytime you pick a descriptor that you want to call life, something like viruses might violate it in some interesting way, but you might get cars violating it in another interesting way or fire or anything else. And so it's been really hard to to have a definition that boxes in everything that we want to call life and excludes everything we don't want to call life. And this is why viruses keep being this thing that people want to talk about, but maybe we're not asking the question the right way. Yeah, because you write here, page six, what modern science has taught us is that life is not a property of matter. Well, then yeah. what, what is it a property of? <laughs> well, it's not a property of matter as we know it. Uh, I think that's part of the issue, right? So if you look at the molecules like DNA, for example, viruses can be made out of DNA or RNA, and we wouldn't consider them alive by that NASA definition quote unquote NASA. Um, but nonetheless, they are the product of evolution. Uh, and they're only found in concert with things that traditionally we, we might want to call alive or living like cells. Um, and so a lot of the reframing that I've been doing uh, with my colleagues and trying to think more fundamentally about the nature of life is to think about life as um, the products of evolution. So life is the things that evolution can construct. And those can be very complex objects like a virus or a cell, um, but they don't, they don't necessarily need to be alive in the canonical sense that they're actively 
um, creating new possibilities or generating new structure. And so, um, so this, this issue of the material property becomes really interesting because we've considered traditionally that like if we try to reduce a cell to its atoms, we don't see life present in the atoms. And this is one of the reasons that life is typically described as an emergent property, right? I'm alive, but no atom in my body is alive. So somehow there's this emergent property of, of Sarah, <laughs> that Sarah is a living thing. Uh, and, um, and so this is one of the reasons that materialism or like a material narrative of life hasn't worked in the past because we try to reduce it to the chemical building blocks. But what we're finding with the, the kind of theories and ideas that we're working with is that there are different ways of thinking about the materiality of living things and that the materiality is really associated with the information and the construction of the complexity. And there are ways of thinking about complexity as a physical feature of objects like molecules that allow distinguishing whether they could be uniquely produced by life or not. So it seems to me most of your argument does depend on emergent properties. When I was reading your book, I was thinking of economic concepts like inflation. Mm -hmm. You know, where is inflation in, in my life? <laughs> by myself, it doesn't exist, right? Or unemployment right. or any economic concept depends on, you know, a whole, you know, economy of people, millions of people exchanging looking at individual people doesn't make any sense at all any more than looking at an individual neuron for thoughts. It's, you know, a wave of patterns of neural firings across neural networks and so on. No individual neuron has any idea that it's thinking or if it even is thinking, if that's not even the right word. Yeah. I, I, I think this is a, a sort of a general challenge is that most of the properties that we're interested in are, are ones that are, features of collectives. And so we can't reduce, you know, the properties of life to its component parts any more than you could reduce your example of thinking to a, an individual neuron. It's just, it's a category error to assume that those things should have the same properties. In the case of, of life and trying to think more fundamentally about it, it's actually quite interesting because if you think even in fundamental physics and elementary particles, we think we can reduce you know, like isolate an elementary particle and fully describe it. And therefore, you know, it is a, a fully reductionist narrative where we've taken away all these collective effects and all of these properties of interaction. But even measuring the properties of an elementary particle to make statements about its existence requires it interaction, interacting with a measuring device. So I think in any area of physics, you can't, like in physics being broadly construed, thinking about the nature of physical reality and things we can measure and describe uh, with mathematical theories, um, you can't get away from this issue of collective effects, but they become more and more pronounced. Um, I think the, the higher the scale of complexity that you get to, so economic systems in your example are like incredibly complex, require billions of agents interacting, people across the planet, governments, um, you know, uh, different uh, companies and sort of divisions of, of the economic system. And that whole infrastructure uh, is is considered an emergent property because it can't be reduced to its elementary particles and explain all of it. But I think, you know, like they're they're just two totally different scales of reality and have two, you know, totally different sets of, of principles and laws. But but the issue of, of collective behavior and emergent properties, I think, transcends those scales. It's just a matter of degree. Yeah. So life is a process, not a thing itself. You talk about vitalism. You know, the old vitalists thought of this as like a life force. That's something floating around inside the body of the dog that's now alive, and then it's dead. Where did it go? You know, where did the vitalist soul part of it go? But no one talks like that anymore. Would they just know that the physiological processes that were the alive dog have just simply stopped functioning? Mm -hmm. So like the, this is my analogy, the pancreas is involved in digestion. So where does the pancreatic digestive process go when you die? It doesn't go anywhere. It, it isn't off to the quantum ether where yeah. consciousness is supposed to go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why do, why do people tend to think of consciousness and sentience as a product of the brain as existing like a vital force like life mm -hmm. used to be thought of? Yeah. Well, I think traditionally we have a tendency to want to... Um, like for things we don't understand to put them in this kind of like mystical context because we don't understand them. And there's also issues about the fact that our mind feels other from the physical world, just in terms of our conscious experience. And so I think a lot of these properties that are associated with 
abstract things like like conscious thought, which doesn't feel very physical to us, or information, uh, for example, like the kind of patterns that emerge in biological systems, uh, we tend to think of being as more mystical because we don't have really good physical narratives for them. And so, and I think it, it doesn't help that there's a lot of people that want to sort of conflate, um, you know, unknowns with each other. <laughs> like you're saying, like quantum mechanics is mysterious. Why don't we just explain it as, you know, the underlying mechanism of consciousness. Um, and those things may be related, but they are probably more related, like they're they're related in a more deep way than just like taking consciousness and saying it explains consciousness, right? Like if you want to explain those two things together, you would have to have a deeper theory that actually explains both, not just assuming that they're like directly at the same level of abstraction and one explains the other. Um, and this is actually the pattern of scientific progress. If you think about like electricity and magnetism, we used to think they were entirely different. And then we come up with a unified theory of electromagnetism by looking at a deeper structure that actually unifies them. And so there tends to be it also, you know, UFOs are another great example. It's like you take one unknown, you know, like people see sightings of things that they can't explain and alien literally means I don't understand it. I don't, exp I, I can't explain it. And then those become the same thing. Um, so I think we have a tendency, um, not for bad reasons, but just because it's easier to explain unknowns by grouping them together. Um, but I don't think that's necessarily a productive way of approaching actually answering those questions. It might feel satisfying in the moment to say, okay, well, now I understand these two things because they look similar to me. Um, but it doesn't really make progress on these these hard questions, which really require a lot of deep thought, a lot of trying to come up with new scientific tests for ideas um, and really trying to dig deeper into the nature of these phenomena. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. You need a new physics. Here's what you write. Personally, I'm convinced that there's entirely new physics in the living universe, the part of the reality that includes living things awaiting our discovery. Uh, are you a materialist? Let me let me just ask it this way because you introduced that part of your book. Yeah, I was trying to remember when I met you who you reminded me of, and then I suddenly realized, uh, "Desperately Seeking Susan" movie with Madonna. <laughs> That's who you remind me of. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Since you cited well, her in there. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. No, that's great. I know. I love Material Girl. It's such a great song. Um, yeah. No, I think I'm a physicist, right? So what I believe exists are things that are part of physical reality. So um, I never found dualism particularly appealing. I think I think a lot of the ways that we we talk about these kind of things just put explanation beyond the boundary of what's actually explainable. So if you want to be a dualist and say, mathematics exists autonomous to our universe or, um, you know, intelligent programmer in the sky that created the simulation exists autonomous to our universe. That's fine. But you've basically pushed all explanation for anything that we actually want to explain into a realm that's not, ex not explainable and not tractable uh, for actually trying to understand what that thing is. And so for me, it's much more pragmatic, but also I think better as a personal philosophy to think that everything has some kind of physicality to it, even the most abstract features of our reality, like language or thoughts. Um, and so I think that does put me as a materialist, but like, as I say in the book, I like, I love Roger Penrose's quote, I'm a materialist, but I, I admit I might not know what the material is. And most of the history of physics has actually been identifying pro like new properties of what we consider to be matter. Um, so, you know, standing at this point in history, we're all pretty comfortable assuming that matter is associated with properties of mass and charge because, but we forget that historically those were invented concepts in some sense, because we had to build the technology to measure those things. And we had to build the theories that actually explained the consistencies and the measurements that we were observing. And then only then did we say, oh, these are the properties that we associate as matter. And these are the ones that are physical. And that's really how physics was born, was by by measurement and trying to build theories from those measurements. And so to think that we have accounted for every single material property to me seems very premature. And just like the ancients could understand some sense of gravity because things fell, I think we have some sense just by our daily life and daily interaction that information matters. We have thoughts. We can communicate by language. Um, and I think trying to think through how do we actually consider this feature of reality, which seems quite abstract to be material, I think is is uh, really productive as a set of thought experiments, but turns out to be a way to rigorously think about detecting life uh, and measuring its properties. 
uh, in a way that allows us to design new experiments and do and do new science. It's astonishing on that um, rolling balls down inclined planes, Galileo. Yeah. I have a, a eight year old son. He just did his second grade science project. They had to do a little thing where they make a poster board and all. That. So we did uh, uh, Galileo versus Aristotle. First of all, it's astonishing. It took you know two thousand years for somebody to actually <laughs> drop balls to see what happens. Right. <laughs> you know, look out the window. <laughs> and then I was also astonished because it was you know all the everybody in the school came by at everybody's little uh, station there, and how many people? So I had a bunch of different balls there, different sizes, different weights. Some of the same size, different weights, and so on and so on. And then we had a feather. Uh, and how many people just said, "Yeah, I'm pretty sure the heavy one's going to fall faster." <laughs> like, really? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I, even adults, like, yeah, oh, that is so weird that the, they fell at the same rate. It's like, really? It's amazing. Um, you know, it, it also, it's very striking, like, how much we take for granted that we just assume, like, the knowledge of our everyday experience is truth. And and science, obviously, is the progress of questioning those those sort of truths and, like, trying to see are they really true and, like, how, how could we think about them? But I think the point about it taking 2,000 years really speaks to how hard some of these problems are for us to actually conceptualize and think about abstractly and, and test our abstractions with experiments. Um, I mean, I've, I've been thinking a lot like on this, pro this, this issue of material properties, right? So I'm, you know, now on the sort of soapbox of information is material and living things. And actually the material, uh, material property is associated with how these, you know, evolved objects exist in time. So it's, it's related to, to their temporal prop temporal properties, but, um, you know, it's, it's very funny because that sounds really extreme and really radical, but if you think about like Aristotle's theory of gravity, it's like heavy things fall and air like things float. And so he, he understood that the properties of these materials are like the big ball is, you know, like is different than the small ball. Like they understood the material properties were different, but they couldn't find a unifying connection between the different behaviors of these different systems until we really, you know, had a way of accurately measuring time for Galileo's experiments with, with, you know, really precise clocks and accurately weighing mass. And then only then could we actually get accurate enough data to realize the kind of behavior that now, you know, seems kind of funny <laughs> when you're, when your your son's doing a school project. Um, and I think, I think it's kind of the same with life. Like we've taken for granted that, you know, we only have one example of life on earth as far as we know, uh, biochemically, right? So we have DNA, RNA, and proteins form the central dogma of molecular biology. Um, and we don't have other material examples, but one of the arguments I make in the book is that actually life is much broader than that chemistry. It's really about the evolutionary process constructing new forms of complexity. And so even technology in some sense should be considered as part of this evolutionary structure and part of life. And so that's kind of ex extending the way that we think about the substrates of life into new materials. And those new materials are very different, right? They're very different in a lot of their behaviors. But the point being that if you find this deep underlying abstraction, you can unify a description of them in a, in a very um, sort of way that, that doesn't care necessarily so much about the fact that um, some of the properties of the materials are different. And you think about gravity, it's like, you know, the moon is and, and I are like gravitationally attracted to each other. And it's the only things that we care about for describing that are mass and acceleration, right? It doesn't matter that, um, you know, I'm sitting here and chatting with you and <laughs> I'm, uh, you know, wearing glasses today or whatever. Like all those those features of me are irrelevant, but the the moon, you know, and the moon's composition is irrelevant um, and its color is irrelevant. So like, how do you figure out which features are relevant and which aren't for describing particular physics? And I think the thing that we're really coming to um, in the concepts of assembly theory, which we're trying to use to describe the origin of life and also look for alien life, is that the things that really matter are this process of building up complexity, how it's constructed. Um, and and so and then it becomes like a feature of how deep an evolved object is in time. So it took several billion years for our planet to produce you and I were pretty deep in time. But cells maybe are less because they, they evolve early on. They're easier to build. Um, and actually embedding that feature as a feature that's really the relevant one and like how, how, how much history, how much construction, how hard is it for the universe to make this object? How much information does it require? Um, and, and that seems to be the feature that really allows us to talk 
more objectively about the nature of life and really try to build it into a theory that allows us to test when the origin of life can emerge in chemistry, which is my ultimate goal. <laughs> Eventually, yeah. we'll see aliens coming out of the lab or some life form well, evolving out cool. of some chemical soup, we hope. But but that's the idea is that we'll actually be able to test it. By the way, let me give you parenthetically, if you want to run the experiment that they did on the moon, but you don't have a vacuum, you can take a, a book, we'll use your book, uh -huh. and your press release, and you can drop them together, and the book hits much faster than the press release, or you could just put the piece of paper on top of the book and drop them together, and they drop at the same time. So you've removed that. the f factor of error yeah. by just putting. Yeah, yeah. I can't Amazing. take credit for that. It was I just Googled uh, second grade science projects and I found that one. <laughs> uh, okay, so um, in your materialist worldview, where are Platonic ideals like cubes or I don't know what yeah. uh, logic um, rationality? Where are the laws of nature? I mean. There's some equations people like you can write out for when a mm -hmm. star converts helium, hydrogen to helium under certain pressure and temperature, whatever it is. But if there's no humans uh, and there's no sentience in the universe, those things still happen, right? But not the mathematically? Things, the things still happen, but as far as I'm concerned, the laws and the mathematics exist in human minds and in our technology. They don't exist autonomous to us. And so we use our mathematics and our laws of nature to describe features of the physical world as we observe it. But I don't think that mathematics has an autonomous reality. I think it's a physical system. It's a collective system, just in the same sense economics is a collective system that emerged on our planet. And one of the reasons that we have a bit of a challenge with thinking that the laws of physics are autonomous to us or as we write them down as mathematical equations or that math, um, you know, lives in some perfect platonic realm, is that mathematics has become the language that we use to describe the universe that is most universal. It applies to the largest uh, set of phenomena. So it looks like these patterns exist outside of us, but I, I think I think there's a, there's an underlying objective reality, and it has regularities associated to it that we're capturing. But I don't think that mathematics itself exists outside of us. I think it requires something that can build representations and be capable of abstraction in order for mathematics to exist as a physical system. And it is a physical system. <laughs> it exists inside our universe, inside our societies and us as collectives. Okay. And would you put information in that same yes. category? Yeah. Yes. Um, and sometimes I'll say that mathematics is um, a kind, the kind of information that our biosphere evolved, which is... Um, most readily copied between different things and retaining its meaning. So, you know, for example, we've been talking about the laws of physics. F equals MA is probably one of the simplest. Force equals mass times acceleration, uh, which Newton came up with. You know, if I tell you that formula, you know exactly what it means if you're trained in mathematics. Um, and you can use it to do things. You can use it to launch satellites into space. You can use it to build a catapult. You can use it for your second grade experiment. <laughs> um, but you... Um, but, you know, if I if I told you, you know, if your listeners right now, like, might not know my sh shade of, like, my dress is orangish, I think. Um, <laughs> you don't know what shade of orange. If you only hear me, you have to see it on the audio, and it might be distorted color. So maybe you've lost all information about what the original color um, is. So, so there's, like, when we communicate by language, uh, English language or any other um, sort of human language, a lot of the information is very imprecise and we're constantly, you know, playing with words to play with their meanings, to try to relay more precise information. Mathematics seems to be much more precise and reliable when we transfer it between people. And so this is one of the reasons that I think it's still information. It still has the same properties of any other evolved communication system, but it's the one that is the most reliable to move between different things like us and our computers. Um, and therefore, it, it seems to have this property of being much more abstract than uh, to our minds than maybe its physical reality actually is. You know what you should do since you like clothes? Yeah. You should get, you should get the dress. Remember the dress from a couple of years ago? The one that was blue and black oh, or gold right. and white? Oh, my God. I could do real-time <laughs> experiments. That would yeah. be amazing. You could walk around with this dress on going, what do you see? <laughs> I should just design a whole fashion line like that. That would <laughs> be, be amazing. really funny. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about explanations. I, I, yeah. I think it was Wittgenstein who said if the if the sun did go around the Earth, what would it look like? It would look yeah. like it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. 
Yeah. So, you know, let's let's talk about different kinds of explanations. You you cite um, David Deutsch, one of my favorite authors. His Beginning yeah. of Infinity was one of the best books I've ever read. Really phenomenal. I mean, so in other words, instead of saying, um, uh, you know, you're you're wrong or whatever, you can say, well, that's an explanation, but it's not a good explanation or there's a better explanation. That's right. Yeah, no, I'm a huge fan of David's work also, in part because I think he articulates the nature of explanation so well. And so this is one of the the things for me about sort of the culture around um, claims of alien life. And I, and I mean both the scientific culture and sort of the pop culture, right? So in popular culture, we have UFO sightings and, and personal encounters and, and people claiming that we've already made contact. And in the astrobiology community, you know, we'll have things like the ALH meteorite and announcing, you know, P President Clinton announcing detection of potential microbes in a Martian meteorite or more recently phosphine on Venus. Um, and I think um, I think all of these kind of detections that gain popular attention in the media are events, right? Like there's some unexplained thing that we then try to associate with alien life. And really the most important thing that we need to do if we want to solve the origin of life and we want to understand what alien, the possibilities for alien life are, is to develop an explanation for the phenomena of life. So it's really the explanation that's most important. And as I pointed out in the book, like good explanations are actually really hard to vary. Um, you know, the laws, of, the laws of gravitation are the way they structured the way they are because they have a good correspondence with the world. And if they didn't, we would have thrown them away centuries ago. But we can't change them dramatically and still have them be the same laws and principles. And I think a theory that explains life will have that property. It'll be broadly explanatory of a large range of phenomena that we observe in our universe and kind of, you know, group them together under this phenomena we now call life, but we'll have a deeper understanding. Um, but that explanation is, is the thing that we want if we want to know what aliens are and we want to make contact with aliens or if we want to solve the origin of life. It's not just you know, saying I saw, you know, I saw, uh, you know, something in the sky or I, um, you know, I detected this molecule in the atmosphere of an exoplanet. Those are those are not life. They might be pointers to something uh, that we should investigate further. But life is is something that we don't understand. And if we understand what it is, then we have an explanation for all of these uh, things. So I, I like the the Carl Sagan quote extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence and people throw it around all the time. I'm sure you hear this all the time, but for me, like, you know, and inspired by, by David's arguments in beginning of infinity is really, um, you know, extraordinary claims could have really simple evidence, but they need extraordinary explanation. And you could think about gravitation again, since we've been talking about that, um, you know, the evidence for gravity has been around <laughs> us, like, forever, right? Like, I mean, people had been rolling balls down inclined planes and seeing planets move across the sky. And we had no explanation for those things. The evidence was completely ordinary. But what Newton did and Galileo did and that whole generation did was actually try to think deeper about the nature of the explanation. They unified all motion, including terrestrial and celestial motion with a really simple, um, really universal pr set of principles that allow us to understand them in a deep way. And I think what we'll find with life is all of these things that we thought were totally disconnected and separate. You know, there is some underlying deep set of principles and that's what we need. And once we have that, you know, like first contact should be easy and we'll know it when we see it, but we won't know what we're talking about until we know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Which is like... By the way, parenthetically, that other conference uh, that Peter Thiel put on in Florence, Italy, uh, the Galileo Museum is there, and at the Galileo Museum are these uh, inclined planes that he rolled the balls down. Oh, that's so cool. And one of which had little bells. Each time the ball went underneath, it dinged the bell, so you could actually listen to the time differences. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty that's cool. That's so cool. That's <laughs> yeah. so cool. And, of course, the timing is pretty crude, right? It's just a little sand. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sand but that was yeah. enough, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess yeah. I misspoke earlier. I said he had mechanical clocks, but I know he, was, he wasn't he was using those Well, he, yet, Well, but... he had also had pendulum clocks, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah did that as well. So yeah. the EQRI principle, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. You make a really important point um, that you also need an explanation. So yeah. this brings up another philosophy of science question. You know, what does it take to accept a, mod a, a theory, right? So yeah. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection was largely accepted long before Crick and Watson and the mechanism mm -hmm. of DNA explained how exactly it's happening inside the organism. Yeah. 
So you can have it that way, although Wegener's theory of continental drift was not accepted until the 60s when it was clear that there are these plates that float around. But how mm -hmm. can a continent float? That doesn't even make sense. And then yeah. you get these you know, uh, deep sea drills and they go, oh, there's this active stuff underneath the crust that's floating around and there are these giant volcanic cells or whatever they're called. And they push the, and then it's like, oh, okay, now we have a mechanism. So that makes the, the theory more acceptable. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on to what extent you need a mechanism versus just a lot of evidence to show that something's happening? Yeah, I think those are two interesting examples you've given actually, because it, in the juxtaposition of them, like I can think about evolution being something I observe in my daily life in some sense, even though, um, you know, a lot of evolutionary change happens much longer than a human lifespan. We see the diversity of life forms around us. We see, you know, through our agriculture and selection that organisms can change over generations. I mean, you could do it with plants in your backyard pretty quickly, right? So we see that kind of change in our daily life. So I think it's a little easier to accept a theory that's trying to explain that. But I think like plate tectonics, it's like, you know, rocks don't move. <laughs> they don't move over anything that like humans are cognitively aware of. So I think understanding like a theory like that really requires much more evidence and, um, and data to support the mechanism of it, because it's not something that we really have direct contact with, um, just in the patterns that we see in our environment on a, on a, a lifespan or a multi-generation lifespan, right? So like, like, geological change is longer than the stories that we tell ourselves, right? We can pass generate like a story from one generation to the next to the next, but after, you know, many centuries, those stories get lost. So if there was change on that scale, it's not something that would be in sort of the collective psyche of, of human societies. So, um, so I think that's probably why in those particular examples, it, you know, one theory was accepted before the mechanisms were really nailed down versus another that, you know, is a, a equally valid theory, but the mechanisms, uh, you know, came to be understood as, as more and more data was accumulated. It's interesting to me, you know, like working on the nature of life. We, we had a paper that came out last fall that was, uh, you know, like had like a lot of reception when it first came out. And it was very funny because a lot of people were saying like, this is the worst written paper ever. And then there was all this stuff about like the controversy, the theory and things. But it's so interesting because I have people coming up to me, um, you know, when I travel places and saying like, this paper was so readable. I gave it to my family and they read it too. <laughs> and, was that the nature um, paper? Yeah, that was the nature paper. So I, it's been like really widely read. Um, and it's interesting that people that pick it up and say, oh, this is very intuitive to me. This is like this is how I think life works versus the sort of um, people that have been scientifically trained and then have one way of thinking about the world and in some sense become closed off to new ways of thinking about it. And, you know, one of the challenges was, uh, you know, we're limited in word choice. We have certain words that we use to describe how the world works. And if you're trying to build a new idea, you have to use the words we have already. And so some of it was a confusion over the nature of certain words and the way we were using them. Like selection is usually considered as a passive filter and we were using it more as an active mechanism. Um, and so, so I think there's, there's a lot of layers to what gives scientific theories traction or not. Um, and some of it is the social context of the scientists themselves, that new ideas are hard to push on some scientists, um, whereas others are more ready, ready to accept it. And then obviously the younger generation looks at the ideas and tries to evaluate them on their own merit. And then, and then that allows space for new ideas to emerge um, and gain more scientific consensus, uh, yeah, but, but you also are, it's social you, you, factors of of just people. <laughs> but you are doing yeah. this from inside the field. I mean, you're yes. an expert in the field, and you're saying we need a new paradigm. You're not For an sure. outsider. No, I'm not an outsider. I mean, like I, I run a lab of like 15 people. We have to publish papers. We have to write grants. Like we are very much in in the scientific community, and um, and but I've always felt with the Origin of Life in particular that new ideas were needed because the problem had been, you know, persistently hard and untractable for so long, which is one of the reasons that it's such a debate um, in pop culture with intelligent design and, um, you know, uh, more theological narratives holding, you know, like holding court right alongside the scientific narratives, because we don't, we don't know, we don't know the answer to this question. And so uh, for me, 
you know, that just really says we should just say we don't know and we should come up with new ideas. <laughs> um, but but it is hard in the academic community uh, to really be doing that. So I understand, um, you know, why not everyone is saying, like, tear it all down and build something new. Like, we can't all do that. It's really hard. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I've been really lucky in my career um, that we've been having uh, some success asking really hard questions. But um, but yeah, so, so I guess, yes, I'm, I'm inside it, but I'm also challenging it. Um, and I think that's okay. I think that's part of, part of what. Well, we yeah, do. I think it's needed. So yeah. your, your mentor was Paul Davies. I've known Paul a long time. He's, yeah, he's great. such a great guy. He had this idea of a second Genesis on earth. Mm -hmm. Let's see if we can find some, uh, life that was not based on RNA and DNA or something like that. So let's say you found that or you or one of your you or one of your colleagues found a biosignature around one of these exoplanets and everybody mm -hmm. agrees yes absolutely those are CO2 gases that can only be produced by plants or some such thing like that. Would that be enough or would would critics still say you haven't given us a mechanism for how that could have come about? Yeah, so if it was something like a, a atmospheric gas like CO2 or oxygen on an exoplanet, I would not I would personally not be convinced. Um, because those things can be produced pretty readily abiotically. And I think the issue with exoplanets in particular is we don't really know a lot about these worlds and our atmospheric models. Like we do the best we can. And I think the exoplanet community is pretty amazing in how industrious they are um, as far as trying to understand the properties of these worlds. But you can't exhaust all abiotic possibilities to say definitively this was an alien biosphere. And then, of course, we don't know all the possible alien metabolisms there could be on a planet. So I, th I think that's never going to be definitive. I think it's a good first pass for us to, like, sort of guide our search and do mission planning. Um, so, for example, I'm, I'm part of the Hab Worlds Observatory uh, planning, um, you know, working on biosignature stuff. And a lot of their biosignatures that they're focused on right now are these more traditional you know, oxygen and methane in an exoplanet atmosphere. And I think that's okay for now, but I'm never going to be convinced <laughs> by that. I want us to figure out better ways of inferring the presence of life um, based on the idea that that once a planet emerges a biosphere, um, you know, biospheres are the only things that can explore the space of the complex. And so we need to figure out ways to infer that from exoplanet atmospheres. And I have a PhD student in my lab right now that's working on that. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's a would, really hard problem. <laughs> yeah, what would be a, I don't know, biosignature is maybe not the right word. What so, are you looking well, for? We're trying to apply assembly theory to exoplanet atmospheres. The challenge is the way that we developed it for life detection um, in aqueous chemistry was, um, so I mentioned this idea of like the evolutionary history to build an object. So we have this way of talking about that in terms of what we call the assembly index in chemistry, where you take a molecule apart to its, its um uh, constituent bonds, and then you join bonds together to start making parts of molecules, and then you can take those parts to make larger parts, and then base eventually you get to the molecule that you've observed, and that defines its assembly index. And then if we find high assembly index molecules that require a lot of evolutionary steps or a lot of constraints on the space of possibility, so high information objects, if we find those in high abundance, meaning that there was some process that was selected to produce construct that object, so it actually, you know, has become a reliable feature of that planetary chemistry because there's an evolutionary process, an organism that can generate that molecule. Um, uh, we we have those two features and we validated it for aqueous chemistry using like standard lab equipment, like a mass spec. It basically turns out that for chemistry on Earth, organic chemistry that our Earth produces about, above about 15 assembly index, if you observe molecules in high abundance, we've only found them in life. Um, now, turning that idea into a biosignature for exoplanet atmospheres is quite hard because we don't use hydrogen atoms. <laughs> this is a little bit technical. We don't use hydrogen atoms in, um, in molecular assembly for aqueous chemistry, like the kind that we study in the lab. But hydrogen is obviously like critically important in atmospheres, and most of the, the chemistry in the atmosphere is built on making and breaking hydrogen bonds along with the other things. So we're trying to figure out basically how do we actually measure this same feature of evolutionary causation in the kinds of molecules and the distribution of molecules you see in an atmosphere. Um, so you can think of it basically as trying to look for signatures of complexity in atmospheric chemistry. Um, and I had earlier with a previous PhD student done that in terms of network theory. But I think what's interesting about the assembly framework and one of the reasons I've been gung-ho about it since I got involved uh, working with Lee Cronin, who originally developed the mass spec measure of assembly, um, to develop the theory using this framework – 
because I always was interested in like a fundamental theory explain life. Uh, the reason I love assembly is it's so deeply tied to things you can measure and observe that you actually have a chance of validating what you're trying to do. And so what I'd love to be able to do is like detect life on an exoplanet and be really confident we've detected a biosphere or technosphere because we don't think that any abiotic world could ever generate such a complex configuration of the data that we observe. So it's and testable. I, it's testable, yeah. Yeah. Testable some, is important. <laughs> yeah. As an explanation, yes. Uh, yeah, falsifiable. Yeah, that's I mean, I right. think science operates in two ways. There, It is a Bayesian uh, process in which you're trying to accumulate more and more positive evidence in favor of your theory over some other theory. Yeah. But at some point, you have to be able to test it also. It has right. to be Popperian fals falsifiable. Um, let's come back to assembly theory and, and, and network theory in, in just a moment. But I want to... Um, just touch on aliens as a concept yeah. and the fascination with it. I mean, you're, you're in part adjacent to that, although you're not into the UFO UAP thing, mm -hmm. but I'm on, um, uh, Avi Loeb's Galileo project. I'm sort of his token skeptic. <laughs> so, uh, Everyone you know, needs I did one. A, <laughs> was that, yeah, they need one. Yeah. Well, okay. I'm going to ask you why that is. There's a, he has a massive following now. I mean, there's billionaires giving him millions of dollars to go find the aliens at the bottom of the ocean. They think yeah. he's going to dredge up the Millennium Falcon dashboard, right? And he's he's pretty clear about this. That's not what we're going to find. We're going to find these little spherules. And I think maybe they have a slight different ratio of isotopes that you would normally find in some um, extra solar system object that comes in, interstellar object that comes in and so on. And it gets fairly technical. And, you know, when I ask people that are experts on these spherules, they go, no, 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 that, that um, he has not found anything yeah. unusual. And he says, yes, we did. It started, so it, it often comes down to these little anomalies. Like um, another example is um, Tabby Star. Remember that? Yeah, Tabitha? I remember. It, yeah, Tabitha. It, it, yeah. This was a huge media event. I remember because I was uh, already mm -hmm. on a, a, a talk show in L.A. Uh, John and Jillian, you know, drive time talk show, right? So the, this story comes up. And the first question that Jillian asks is, well, what are they like? It's like, what is who like? The aliens. It's like, all she found was a little blip in the mm -hmm. light curve or whatever it was. It's like, yeah. but people immediately go to the U and UFO gets transmogrified yeah. into aliens and so on. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Do you think what's the fascination? Um, well, I, I saw I think aliens are kind of our, our, as I sort of mentioned before, they're, they're kind of our fill in the gaps for anything we can't explain. So it used to be like it was angels or, you know, some other mythological creature did it. And now, you know, aliens have basically become our modern mythology. So anytime that we can't explain something, it's like the first go to place for the unexplained rather than something um, that might seem more mythical because aliens in some sense have some you know, they feel more real to us, <laughs> to some of us um, as an explanation, but they're nonetheless, you know, still this sort of, I think, placeholder for things that are unknown. Um, and I think, I think in, in Avi's case, it's, it's really interesting because I think the one thing that Avi does well that I don't see a lot of other people do as well as he does is he really believes that we're going to find aliens, right? And I think a lot of um, people are a bit more cautious in the way that they talk about it. Um, so I think that kind of fosters that excitement. A lot of people are, and myself included, are super excited about the possibilities of discovering alien life. But I think it's also really quite challenging because I think, you know, he, he's not he's not working under the premise of a hypothesis of what he's looking for. He doesn't have an explanation for the phenomena that he's looking for. He's not testing a theory. He is going on this idea of anomaly detection. So he's kind of capitalizing on the mystery of the fact that, you know, we want to associate the unknown with alien. And so he's going to go out and look for the unknown and therefore it will be alien. Um, and I think that's not really the best way of conducting the science. And ultimately it's not likely to be successful because he doesn't have guiding principles about what he's looking for. So he can't even constrain the sort of set of possibilities with which he wants to operate. And so something like the spiracles, you know, that, that discovery Avi could, you know, be claiming that they're alien in origin for the rest of his life, but that's not going to gain any traction because there's plenty of data that suggests that there are other sphericals that other people have detected with consistent um, isotope ratios that, you know, are of known origin in the solar system or beyond. So it's, you know, it's it's kind of hard to say what is it that he's trying to discover. Um, yeah. 
Well, one of my suggestions to him, he said he would do it this summer, is to drag that magnetic sled over some area you don't think the interstellar meteor landed to see if the serials are different from the one area to yeah, the other Yeah, I mean, I think, I think people have done that. You know, he might have to do it to convince himself, but... Um... But but and I, and that's fine. But I, I think what I'd really like to see him do is to try to make, you know, he's a theory, he's a theoretical astrophysicist. He he's studied, you know, theories and understands how we can make predictions on them. If he could have some, you know, motivation for why he thinks aliens have the properties that they do and why he's looking for those, I think I would find it much more scientifically interesting. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so. um assembly theory maybe you could give us a, a brief explainer of this i mean yeah. in other words what, what you're doing is we need a, a completely new approach okay fine what is that approach sure uh, yeah <laughs> um well it, it's it's very uh multi-layered right so yeah. i think the idea of trying to quantify it's for me it started with trying to quantify the transition from non-life to life right so we talked about the fact that defining life is hard um that you know, most efforts to try to solve the original life only get so far as very simple molecular building blocks. It's It pales in comparison to the complexity of a functioning cell. And so we have this like very large evolutionary gap between simple chemistry and cells that we don't understand. Um, and so, um, so that whole set of questions has really been the main motivator of my career. And what really struck me as a student of physics, so I came through the traditional theoretical physics education. So I was a PhD student in a cosmology group. I went all the way up through like quantum field theory and general relativity. So like I had a pretty good understanding of like the broad class of theories that we had developed in physics. It didn't seem that any of the structure of any of those theories was really adequate for this problem of the original life for a variety of reasons. Um, but it seemed to be the case that most physicists, when they they actually worked on the origins of life, wanted to apply non-equilibrium statistical physics to solve life. So the conjecture there being life is just a non-equilibrium state of matter. Um, but I, you know, I use an example of like a counterexample in the book about how we have non-equilibrium self-organized structures on the surface of Jupiter, which is like the great red spot. And on earth there are cities, right? So, and we have, we have storms too, but let's contrast cities. You know, cities take billions of years to form on a planet because they require an evolutionary construction process learning about the environment and over many billions of years, maybe involve, evolving intelligent things like us that then can construct cities. And cities retain all of that history because you could look inside a microbe and you could you know, recapitulate the history of Earth by retracing its genomic information. Cities retain a lot of cultural and um, architectural history of human civilization. Like there's a lot of information in a city. If you look at the great red spot of Jupiter, you, you can't deconstruct that object and learn anything about the history of Jupiter. It's a self-organized storm that, and you know, and similar storms might've happened in the past, but it doesn't retain all that information and all that history. So to me, non-equilibrium structures are just not sufficient to explain the things that life does. Um, and so, you know, looking across all these areas of physics, I just, I, I really felt none of them were sufficient. And so when I started working at Arizona State University um, with Paul Davies, um, I showed up on a NASA fellowship. Basically, I had proposed the idea of trying to quantify the origin of life in terms of information, because information seemed to be the one thing that wasn't really, a, it wasn't a natural category in physics, right? Like we could use it to describe things in physics, but it wasn't like, it wasn't a material property. It wasn't a physical variable. Um, but it seemed to be something that was really deeply intrinsic to life. And, and Paul really resonated with that idea and had written about similar things over his career. So he, he basically, I showed up <laughs> uh, here at Arizona State and I was like, I want to work on the origin of life. And he's like, OK, write a paper. What do you think the origin of life is? And I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> I don't know. Um, so then I ended up writing this paper with him called The Al Algorithmic Origins of Life, which tried to pin down uh, this idea that the origin of life is somehow a transition an informational and causal structure. So basically this idea that these things that we consider to be abstract, whether it's the information inside uh, a genome, right? Like DNA is just a physical molecule. How can it carry information that patterns a cell or whether it's the language I'm communicating to you now, which is traveling across space and time and presumably, you know, presumably retains meaning associated with it. Like these are sort of weird things that life does. 
um, they all emerged and they can be causal, right? So, you know, I could ask you, Michael, to raise your hand and I could ask your audience to raise their hand. I just hit my microphone. Sorry. Um, <laughs> it's a very animated conversation. Um, you know, some of you might raise your hand. All right. Raise your hand. Okay. So I can cause, you know, things to happen with the information. And so that sort of structure, I think, uh, you know, identified as really being the critical transition. Um, and um, at the same time, uh, you know, in, in Glasgow, um, a few years after I wrote that paper, uh, Lee Cronin was trying to figure out, he's got these robots he was trying to build <laughs> to explore chemical space to look for new life forms. Um, so he was interested in the origin of life and he's really built, he has a huge lab and he's built a lot of technology to basically um, uh, digitize chemistry and allow robots to do chemical synthesis, but not just any chemical synthesis, not specific chemical synthesis, but general chem chemical synthesis. So he has this idea of computation, which is kind of, you know, for, for David Deutsch fans, it's like a universal constructor for chemistry. So like it's a, it's a chemical system, a chemical robot that basically can do any kind of chemical synthesis. So, so that's why we say it's universal. And then it's actually doing the, the, the chemistry. So this is any synthesis that humans have done in the lab. It's not like any possible synthesis because we haven't discovered all the other possible syntheses, but, you know, based on current human knowledge. Um, and the idea there was if you could build such a machine, <laughs> then we could look for the origin of life in the lab because we would be able to explore chemical space more efficiently than just pipetting and trying to make an amino acid or something like current state of the art in origin of life is. Um, and so Lee had a challenge of trying to measure success. Uh, like if you just had a chemical soup and you were watching it evolve, how would you know that there was life there? Right. So most of our ways of identifying life on Earth are based on fingerprinting DNA, for example. So if you you hear these stories of like, you know, discovering new life in the ocean on this, you know, epic voyage that went to, you know, characterize life on Earth, it's all, you know, based on recognizing DNA sequences. So if you imagine you had a chemical system that evolved in the lab and it didn't have DNA, like how would you actually know it was an evolutionary system? So Lee came up with this very clever idea of measuring this property of assembly in molecules using mass spec. So a mass spectrometer is a typical instrument that people have in the chemistry lab. It, it measures properties of molecules by breaking them apart. And most of the time, people actually use it to identify known molecules. But what Lee's lab started doing is actually trying to use it to measure the complexity of molecules to determine if they were products of evolution or not. And so he was working on that along, around the same time I was coming up with these ideas about information and causation. And it turned out assembly theory was really measuring those properties. And so we started trying to work together on developing a more fundamental theory that we could test in the lab that would allow us to quantify the origin of life transition and when we could say things were uniquely produced by life. So that's sort of the history. Um, and then assembly theory is the product of that. And what assembly theory aims to do is, it, well, what it conjectures is that life is the only mechanism that the universe has for generating complex objects and that there's a real threshold in chemical space. So if you're imagine building up molecules by parts, um, the space of possibilities is actually exponentially expanding. It might even be double exponentially expanding. So Sometimes I, I will tell people, like, you know, we think the physical universe is large in terms of stars or galaxies or, you know, just the physical volume. But if you think about the size of chemical space, it is bigger than astronomically large, the, the space of possible molecules. So uh, an example um, I like to give that I actually took from Lee is to think about the molecule Taxol. Uh, you know, it's a small molecule-ish. It's a lot smaller than DNA. It only has a molecular weight of 853 and if you want to take its molecular formula and make one copy of every molecule, like just one molecule of each possible structural permutation, it would fill 1.5 universes. So, which is crazy, right? So when you're thinking about a prebiotic soup on a planet or a meteorite right, making uh, chemistry, right? In the absence of selection constraints on that space or directed synthesis of particular molecules, which is what life does, you know, it's just making stuff at random. And this is why we get tar in prebiotic chemistry. And we also just, you know, like if you look at a meteorite, it's just like, you know, it's just a whole bunch of undifferentiated molecules. We actually can't even fingerprint all of them. There's thousands and thousands of mo different molecules in meteorites um, because the space is so large, even for small molecules. And so this idea of this assembly theory is that the universe, in order to cross this threshold to build complex things, has to start constraining the space uh, 
via selection and acquisition of information to try to make very specific complex molecules. It can't it can't do that exploration randomly. It has to be along these historically contingent construction pathways, like this idea of reusing parts to build more and more complex objects. And we actually, um, you know, in the the there was a paper that came out in Nature Communications a couple of years ago where we validated um, this for life detection, where we showed that the the complexity threshold appears to be at an assembly index of about fifteen. Um, and so that's showing that like you can't detect. Uh, you can't detect abiotic samples generating higher complexity than that in abundance, right? So like you might randomly produce one molecule on a planet that's very high complexity, but you're not going to make it twice. Um, and so, um, so this, and you're certainly not going to make it three times or four times or five times, right? Like the, the high abundance of complex things only happens through evolution, selection, information being acquired to make that specific thing and then being able to make it again and again and again, which is what our biosphere has done for pretty much every object that we've ever generated. Um, but I also, what I'm super excited about with assembly theory is that because of this idea of this threshold, um, and the structure of the theory being built on this idea of assembly spaces. So an assembly space is just the set of operations to build an object along that sort of shortest path. So we describe all objects as having an assembly space. It's the space that they live in just like you know, planets live in physical space, uh, you know, like like an X coordinate. We have sort of a coordinate of assembly index and copy number in the assembly space. Um, that framework, I think, allows us to actually quantify the origin of life and predict when it happens. And that's one of the things that my lab is working on right now. And we have a lot of indications that there's a phase transition that happens in assembly theory in this idea of like building all possible objects versus constraining yourself to just build a few and cascade the complexity and, and build more complex objects. Uh, there's a there's a really abrupt transition that happens in these spaces, and and that's really I think what we're looking for when we're looking for the origin of life is this constraint in the space of possibilities to make some things and not others. That's what selection is, and then um, to build them in this historically contingent way where you're reusing parts, and then once that happens, you basically have a transition into evolution and life as we understand it. Um, okay. Yeah. There are some of your languages very teleological. Yes. I think you're using that metaphorically, right? You don't mean that the universe is actually wants anything. No, I don't mean the universe wants anything, but I, but I, I'm, I really deeply appreciate you pointing out that I use teleological language because I do that very purposefully um, in the sense that life is the emergence of teleology, right? So if you want a mechanism for explaining the emergence of life, you have to explain the emergence of teleological narratives where there are none. Um, and so I think kind of playing with that sort of narrative is kind of interesting in the context of the origin of life. Is it um, is sort of the history of evolutionary theory debates, you know, to what extent is evolution directional or teleological? You know, Dawkins talked about the evolution of evolution. Um, yeah. You know, and, and Gould always pointed, Steve Gould always pointed out that if you're at the left wall of simplicity, you can only move one direction if you put energy into a system. It simply has to get more complex. There's nothing special about that or directional. It's just the only way the system can move. Right. So I have sort of a different conception of things. I know like Stephen Jay Gould used that based on a random walk model. So the idea was that you could go forward or backward equally likely. And I actually think uh, if assembly theory is the right underlying explanation, that evolution does have a directionality to it because assembly theory is really deeply related to like sort of a, a different kind of fundamental concept of time where time, time and causation are, are kind of the same thing in assembly theory. Um, but if you, and it's interesting because you're like, oh, well, you can't invent a new concept of time, but like every single theory of physics has a different concept of time that was invented with them. So like Newtonian physics invented mechanical time. Um, you know, second law of thermodynamics invented the concept of a directionality of time, right? So like the arrow of time. And then Einstein relativity really invented the concept of simultaneity. And I think it actually has very little to do with clock, oh, like, like passage of time, right? It's more about simultaneity of events. And assembly theory is saying that time has an arrow associated with it, which um, is in terms of, um, uh, in terms of, um, a, like an expansion in the space of possibilities. So time is actually getting larger in terms of the combinatorial kinds of things that you can actually build. And part of the manifestation of that in a thing like a biosphere is that you're actually increasing the assembly index of some of the structure. Now, it doesn't mean that sometimes evolution can't go backwards, but it means that the overall trend uh, 
for life on a planet will be one of open-ended evolution, creating more complex structures. And I don't think that that's necessarily like a teleological argument um, in the sense that it's not, um, you know, it's not like a God of the gaps doing it. It's actually part of the mechanism of what selection and evolution are. And I think this is one of the reasons that, that evolution, you know, evolutionary theory, uh, it's interesting because it's a, it's not a teleological theory that wants to explain the evidence of design. Um, and I think that, you know, saying underlying mechanism is totally random is not exactly accurate and because there is the historical contingency in all of the evolved structure. And that's where the determinism comes from, right? Like I exist today. I'm likely to exist tomorrow. It's not a total random <laughs> wash of, you know, like structuralist features, right, that I'm just fluctuating in and fluctuating out. So it has to be some combination of um, determinant, deterministic uh, dynamics and directionality along with randomness, um, yeah. where the randomness actually helps generate the novelty. So I do I do actually think that there is a, an arrow of increasing complexity associated with the arrow of time in a biosphere. And would that be in the way, say, Simon Conway Morris talks about convergent evolution there's only so many designs of wings to fly in the air fins to yeah. flap through the ocean or whatever you're going to get organisms with you know the sensory apparatus on one end and the waste disposal on the other yeah. end some <laughs> limbs to walk around the, so the aliens <laughs> might look something like hominids uh or you know uh, dinosaurs that are bipedal or, or whatever yeah. it's not completely random yeah, I'm laughing because I was trying to imagine the, it the other way around where, where the sensory perception and like the wastes are on the same end. <laughs> yeah. That just sounds very unpleasant. Um, no. No. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure there's probably some organism on our planet that does that. I don't know. Um, <laughs> probably. <laughs> probably. It, things are so weird. Um, so, you no, know, I do believe that, um, like, you know, just based on evidence and the kind of examples that Simon Conway Morris uh, points to, um, that obviously evolution is convergent based on physical constraints. So there's sort of um, like the laws of physics, you know, like ap apart from me saying that they exist in our minds, but I really like, you know, the, the features that they point to about objective regularities of the world are a real thing. And so evolution, you know, can construct possibilities, can explore different and novel forms, um, but must do so within the constraints that those have to be things that work in our real physical universe. And so I think those constraints really do uh, place limitations on what's possible, right? It's like not like everything that I can imagine can be a physical object. I can't, you know, I can't make a square circle. I can't, you know, Santa Claus will never be real unless our technology gets really advanced and we can make flying. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, some features of Santa Claus, maybe our technology could realize, but not all of them. I think but, some I mean, of a planet with 10 yeah. times our gravity would not have giraffes with long legs like yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I, so I think, I think there are some features of evolution you can predict just based on physical constraints. And one place where you see this very clearly is in the study of scaling laws. You know, I, I spent a lot of time at the Santa Fe Institute and that's a big theme there because yeah. If you look at like metabolic rate versus body mass, for example, there's like incredible regularity. You can predict how large an animal is by its metabolic rate, or you can predict how long it will live based on its metabolic rate. So there's all of these different kind of relationships um, that have to do with physical constraints. And those scaling laws usually come from this fact that like organisms are optimizing against hard physical constraints. Like yeah, the like cities the larger yeah. they get the more efficient or like the fewer right. gas stations they have per capita and so on and the, yeah, and the and roads more become patents, the more dense a city is the more like innovation happens like there are very very predictable behaviors of these systems based on these kind of packing constraints and, and different yeah. kinds of optimization okay back to assembly theory just a couple of questions here so sure. having a, a history not just a history because the great red spot of jupiter has a history right uh it's a history with a certain kind of teleological directionality to it like that you would not see you would see in a city you would not see in a great red spot yeah, or storm and let's just be very clear that the teleology and the history that it looks like the city for like you know it's directed at a city is because the city exists and you built backwards to ask how much the space of possibilities had to be constrained to make a city. That's how much selection yeah. or how much information is contained in a city. Like how much did the universe have to do and how much did it have to exclude by this sort of exploration of the possibility space to make a city? 
Well, let so, me use a different example yeah. then. Uh, Dan Dennett talks about termite mounds. Yeah. In his, in his last book, he had a, a p- pictures of these gigantic termite mounds in Australia. Not None of the termites have any idea they're making these structures that just look like the World Trade Center buildings. Sure. Right? And they operate the same way. They temperature control, and mm-hmm. it's, it's astonishing what they're able to do. Um, you know, because he was making an analogy with neurons in the brain. No neuron knows what it's right. doing. But together they do these things. But that would be an example of what you're talking. Assembly theory would predict something like a termite mound like that. Yeah, yeah. And the same for a city. I mean, no individual human knows how to make a city either. So... Um, so I think these are all great examples and assembly theory, uh, you know, attempts to explain when those things require evolutionary refinement, basically for them to even form in the first place. Right. So like termites, you know, all of those features that you describe about them and like, you know, the fact that they're actually good habitats for termites is the product of evolutionary refinement over many, 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 many generations of termites building mounds, right? Just like our cities have evolved over time to become increasingly efficient. You know, it wouldn't have been the case in ancient times that we could have 10 million people living within a few square kilometers, right? But like now it's actually possible because of our advances in engineering, which have come through refinement by trial and error and also actual intellectual ingenuity and coming up with ideas that we think will work and pre-planning them. Um, and what assembly theory says is that those structures cannot form spontaneously. They have to go through that kind of process. And oftentimes what happens, um, there, there's a feature of assembly theory. So like, like it's really going against some, some very standard arguments in physics, like the idea of Boltzmann brains, which are used in cosmological arguments and come out of uh, statistical mechanics, but also like quantum fluctuations, um, is this idea that a, brain, a fully forming brain Uh, could spontaneously fluctuate into existence um, and then fluctuate out of existence, right? So like you and I could be Boltzmann brains right now and we wouldn't know the difference, but like now we don't exist, but yet we still do. So maybe we just fluctuate in existence now. You know, like I I think I used an example like that in the book. But but what assembly theory says and says very clearly is that, that that spontaneous fluctuation cannot happen because it requires too much design for that object to form spontaneously. It requires this idea of building up information over time and objects actually have to encode the information before an object, before something can be constructed, right? So you won't have cities, like human cities in the absence of humans, like humans are required to build cities. Like they don't exist autonomous to us. Um, And so a, a consequence of this is that a lot of evolutionary structures come with a lot of other evolutionary structures. Right. Because they're all causally connected and all of these features are co-constructing each other. So they they need to actually, you know, have that whole evolutionary chain of events in order to build them. And that chain of events comes with other things that are like them or necessary for supporting their existence. Um, And so so it's not. um, I was going to say it's not teleological in the sense that, like, you know, it's the features of these objects are are already they sort of nece- necessitate features of the things that they actually uh evolve with like they're selected to exist with or they're constructed with is the way the language yeah, I would use. Sarah I mean constructed designed information I know. Aren't these great transitions words? I'm just picturing Stephen Myers and Bill Dembski and these intelligent design people listening to this going she sounds like us I know. I'm giving them a lot of fuel, but the thing is we're going to do experiments and prove how the physics actually works. And I'm pretty sure that it's- From the bottom up, you mean, not the top down. No, not the top down. Well, I think it's interesting though, right? Because because it is like, you know, the reason that they've been so successful in their arguments is because they can point to the fact that these look like design systems and we have no explanation for how the universe can design objects in the absence of a designer. And what assembly theory is doing is providing a mechanism for the emergence of design when there is no designer. From the bottom up. Okay, so here's another one, Dan Dennett's uh, useful analogies. Skyhooks versus cranes. Mm-hmm. You know, the crane is building the building brick by brick from the bottom up. And the skyhook, you know, that just plops the building down into the ground, right? Something like that is was his analogy for what yeah. creationists are arguing versus what evolutionary theorists are arguing. Right. And you're still having a pure materialistic bottom up. And what, information is part of the material world? It's not... I don't yeah. know. It's, it's not a ethereal thing plopped in from outside. Well, it has to be constructed into the objects to really be able to explain where those things come from. And so current evolutionary theory, 
needs to start with something like a cellular architecture, something that already is capable of evolution. And then it can talk about some of the properties of evolution. But there's still some some perplexing issues there, like the, the origination of novelty or why you know, the trend of the biosphere has been toward more complex things. Standard evolutionary theory doesn't explain those features, and it also doesn't explain the origin of life because if you don't have something evolving already, you haven't built the molecules to evolve. There's no explanation for how that that starts. Um, you know, and the canonical, you know, sort of argument there is, well, we'll just make an RNA molecule on the prebiotic earth and it'll start copying itself and and voila, uh, evolution by a Darwinian means gets started and we've solved the origin of life. But that's not actually what we observe in the lab. If you put RNA molecules in the laboratory and you subject them to successive rounds of Darwinian evolution, they get less complex, not more complex. So it doesn't explain anything about how you know, they would acquire a metabolism and a cellular architecture and how the rest of, you know, the evolutionary story gets started. So I think like this idea of a selfish gene is really, or a selfish RNA molecule is really inadequate because it doesn't explain the complexification process. Um, And there's, you know, like all over uh, the biosphere and the history of life, there's examples that we, we have challenged, we're challenged to really describe adequately the origin of life being the most prominent. Um, and so, again, that's not to say that it requires an intelligent designer. It's just saying that there is a mechanism of evolution and selection that might be a bit deeper than than the ones that we have currently based on the idea of— You mean it as an emergent replicator. property or something As an like emergent that. property. That's right. Okay. Evolution is an emergent property of systems that are co-constructing each other and selecting on the features of, of what gets built. That's, and this could happen just by putting energy into the system. Yep, it can happen by putting energy in the system and by random fluctuation of a few things associating, um, you know, to like sort of reinforce uh, selection. So like the idea of autocatalytic sets in the origin of life has been around for a long time, um, you know, proposed by Freeman Dyson and Stuart Kaufman. Um, And the idea there of molecules that can produce other molecules that then produce themselves, I think, is a pretty robust one. But trying to find those structures and also find ones that are robust uh, is quite hard. Um, in part because you have to fine tune the reaction rate. So again, we get into this issue of it. Well, is it designed or is it evolved? Um, and I think what assembly theory offers is that all of those things become emergent properties. So like the reaction rates themselves are emergent of like the way molecules constrain the formation of other molecules. And the formation of these molecules over time uh, can constrain the space such that you actually start building more complex structures and you get ones that are reinforcing um, other ones to persist in the environment. And this eventually transitions to what we would call life. So it's a mechanism of selection that underlies evolution. And I just had a a conversation um, uh, when I was visiting the Santa Fe Institute um, with David Krakauer and uh, Lee Cronin about this, because we were talking about assembly theory and what it does and does not answer. And I think that the real challenge there is that like, if you study evolutionary theory deeply, you realize that there's no theory of selection. Like it's just put in as a passive filter. And what what assembly theory is offering is like a first theory that tries to tackle the problem of selection and say selection had to happen before the origin of life. And some mechanism of evolution had to happen before the origin of life. Otherwise the origin of life wouldn't happen. So there has to be a deeper theory than our current theories. And that's okay. It's like, it's the the analogy I like to make uh, just to try to give like a visual for people is like, Newtonian gravity was not complete. Like it didn't have a mechanism that explained the force of attraction between planets, right? That mechanism came later from Albert Einstein in terms of the curvature of space time. Darwin laid down a theory of evolution. We understand that change happens over time and we have good models of it. And we use the concept of fitness a little like we use the concept of force, right? Like it's something that we put in, but we don't really have an explanation of fitness. Fitness is always defined um, after the fact, right? Like you can talk about the fitness of populations once they've been selected, not before. Um, and what assembly theory is trying to do is provide an assembly space as sort of the space time, so to speak, in which selection operates so that we can actually talk about selection as an active mechanism and not just a passive filter that we talk about after the fact. Yeah. Wow. Okay. You talk about phase transitions in assembly theory. That does sound like what the intelligent design people are talking about. They call this irreducible complexity. How do you get uh, all the parts that have to be there together at the same time if it's a Darwinian selection, one small step at a time, when you don't have all the parts? It looks like somebody put, like the bacterial flagellum, 
or the blood clotting mechanism or the RNA to DNA. In other words, you can get from one to two with Darwin, but how do you go from zero to one That's or right. any of the big steps in there? And you can go up to, you know, mm -hmm. body plans and, you know, new novel types of, of bodies and, and so on. This is where they're saying there's a gap there. And the your colleagues have yet to fill the gap with some natural explanation. Your answer is assembly theory is a testable model for how you can get from zero to one or right. in those phase transitions. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So we're trying to get from zero to one. And I think the irreducible complexity only looks irreducible because of the, the sort of selection process constraining this combinatorial explosion. When you get these sort of reinforcing structures, you know, they they that collapse of that space builds something complex, but you lose all the history of like the particular steps that got there. And it looks like it was designed, but it's actually a structural feature of this mechanism of molecules basically constraining the space of other molecules. Um, and the way that we can talk about the sort of historical contingency in, in the space allows us to actually nail down a mechanism for that. Um, and it is really, I, I right now, and I change my mind depending on how the theory is going and also what the experiments are doing, which is really important not to be like wedded to a particular idea, which is also something that really puts up a red flag for me uh, with some people um, in different communities, including some of the intelligent design people that I'm aware of, because they kind of, uh, it goes back to the theories are good to vary, <laughs> are hard to vary, right? Um, they have an idea and they would rather vary their explanation to stick with that idea than to vary their ideas because the, there's a better explanation, right? And so, um, so I think what we're seeing uh, with assembly theory right now is it's suggesting that the transition is probably very abrupt and that there are structural features of molecules when they exist in the same environment that allow uh, this transition to occur. And it's not irreducible complexity, it's constructed complexity, and there is a mechanism for it um, in this theory. Now, if that pans out and we can test it and it works, then then that becomes an explanation for it. But that's, you know, in progress right now, and, and I'm hopeful. Uh, <laughs> But I, I don't, yeah, I don't believe in irreducible so, anything. I believe the universe is designing itself. And <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, yeah, I'm yeah. with you there, but um, but there are problems to be solved. Would, would some of these other phase transitions include, say, going from prokaryotic to eukaryotic cells? Uh, and yes. what is the what is the current state of the science of what is it symbiogenesis Lynn Margulis's idea of Yeah no I love that field actually um I was recently at um a Solvay conference on biology which was really exciting and a lot of people there were talking about eukaryogenesis and it's very interesting because I think some of the mechanisms that are being proposed are pretty similar to how we're thinking about the origin of life in this transition um in particular how some of the organization of the eukaryotic cell happens so fast on evolutionary time scales um, you know, like with sort of the way that proteins get shuffled around inside the eukaryotic cell and like they know exactly where to go. Um, but, the, you know, like some of the people I was talking to there actually have mechanisms for trying to explain that in terms of act actually autocatalytic feedback. And it looks very much like the kind of stuff that we talk about in rapid transitions in the origin of life. So I think I think um, once we understand how the origin of life emerges, we're actually going to see the same mechanism playing out over many places in the evolution of life where we have very abrupt change that seems inexplicable in terms of standard evolutionary theory, like very rapid transitions where you have this, you know, space of possible configurations that seems too large to have discovered something very fast. I think that's, that's the mechanism that we're trying to understand is that the origin of life has happened there. <laughs> um, you know, so Sagan used yeah. to talk about carbon chauvinists. We're carbon chauvinists. We have to get oh, yeah. out of this, you know. <laughs> but there are constraints, right? I mean, you do need yeah. carbon or something like that. Yep. But it, it, metaphorically speaking, this is kind of what you're doing. We, we've been too constrained by our thinking that at the time being, we need some new big ideas like assembly theory. Yes. I think my, my, my philosophy of approaching these kind of questions has always been, if a question has been open for 100 years <laughs> or more, it probably requires new ideas um, because we would have yeah. solved it already. There are plenty of yes. smart people working on these things. Um, and so I've always kind of adopted in my career like an interest in working on hard problems, but also an interest in working on them because I think they require radically new thinking and I really love the idea of trying to come up with new ideas to solve hard problems. Yeah. Um, so I think the origin of life is going to be solved by something really unexpected. And I'm hoping that that's the work that we're doing now. But but my hope is also 
you know, ultimately, if assembly theory is not the right approach or it's not successful, um, that we will have changed sort of the way that people approach the problem enough to actually try to get more new ideas into this field so that we can we can solve it. Because ultimately, I'd like to see the origin of life solved before I die. Yeah, uh, me too. I've got a finite <laughs> window ahead of me. So, <laughs> you know. What? Um, yeah, I know, right? Wait a minute. You might be one of those uh, transhumanists that gets to live forever. If Ray Kurzweil is right, you'll see the singularity happen yeah. in your lifetime and Amazing. you'll benefit. <laughs> I'm waiting for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a couple last big questions here. Sure. Um, what is the nature of the self? What is an organism in assembly mm -hmm. theory? Are you, Sarah Walker, are you an autonomous individual self? Yeah. Um, I like to think I am, but I also, you know, tend to think about uh, life in terms not of individuals, but more of lineages, uh, which is this idea that, um, like, I mean, we're part of lineages, right? So, like, I, I wouldn't exist without my parents and they wouldn't exist without their parents. So there's this kind of structure of life that life needs to build new life. This is one of the reasons solving the origin of life is so hard because every life, every living thing we see seems to be created by some other thing alive. Um, but also like over the course of your lifetime, you know, you have to eat all the time to just basically be reconstructing your own body. So you're kind of a lineage of the informational pattern, for example, in myself, you know, there's an informational pattern that is Sarah that's constantly reconstructing me. Um, and so, so I'm at sort of this pattern that exists over time. And so this is sort of where the concept of these informational lineages come from. But, um, and I, you know, I, I kind of got this idea of uh, life as lineages of propagating information from my friend and colleague, Michael Lockman. Um, and, you know, Michael will say he's 3.5 billion years old. If you ask him how old he is, it's great. I love that. <laughs> Very honest answer. Um, <laughs> but um, but the, the sort of uh, structure as I see it, um, you know, it's interesting because I'll, 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 nowadays I'll talk about how this is how we see it in assembly theory, but it's actually how I see the regularities associated with life that we're building into the theory. And it's the same with Lee and the other people I'm working with. So these are becoming features of the theory, but they're things that we have thought about for a long time and, and, and have been trying to figure out how to formalize. And so one of them was that, um, and this actually came from an essay I wrote with Michael about why life is not the same as being alive that life is the set of objects that only form in the universe via an evolutionary process. And that includes things like my glasses, um, you know, the microphone, uh, the computer that we're talking on, um, your jacket and your skeptic pin, right? Like these things don't emerge on planets that don't have life. They're just impossible to form in the absence of life. And it also includes things in my body like DNA, um, you know, like my eye color is set by evolutionary selection, all these things. Um, so, we'll call all of that structure life, but it's not like I think the microphone has the same sort of agency or causal power in the universe or autonomy that you and I have. We, we're actually alive because we're actually actively selecting on our environment and exerting causation in the world. And that kind of feature is actually what I would associate with being alive. So some of the things that life constructs have the proper the property that they can continue that process. They can continue evolution and selection and some of them don't. Um, and so we should probably, you know, make a distinction between those. And I think the way that we're building assembly theory, we have a way of talking about both. We've mostly just talked about measuring life. So in some sense, we measure the shadow of selection, things that are very complex that couldn't form without a cell or couldn't form without a human society. We have a way of talking about how hard it is for those things to form in the universe um, and, and then, you know, qualifying that they require an informational lineage to build them. Um, and then we're also trying to work on the fact that there are things like us that are actually really active participants of that evolutionary process. And that's sort of part of the, the feature of this phase transition is like the emergence of those kind of things that have autonomy and, and agency and causal and, power. And would that be the emergence of something like volition, free will, that is yeah. the organism is subject to the laws of physics, but... The organism acts on the physical environment and has some control. And right. from that, is is volition a reasonable word to use to describe yeah, that? Yeah, no, I think volition is absolutely a reasonable word to use. And I think the whole debate about free will is really muddled, just like yes. consciousness and everything else, right? But yes. I think, I you know, the issue, I, and the, you mentioned Dan Dennett a couple of times. I mean, I think he really had a good way of philosophizing this, but, you know, proposed it without mechanism, that free will is really about the nature of causation and control, and, um, 
And so you can't have free will if the universe is entirely random and you can't have free will if the universe is entirely deterministic either, right? Because you need some freedom to operate. You need to be able to make choices, but you also have to have the determinism to exert your will. And I think where that comes from is that determinism is actually built up by causal contingency. So stru structures constraining the space of, of what's dynamically possible leads to deterministic systems. And we see determinism emerge in biology because you see very regular structures being rebuilt over time. But um, but because they're, they're objects that can exist in time, the, the freedom and the free will part is actually executed over time. So free will is, is a feature of... Um, how large in time a particular configuration of matter is. So something like myself, that's very large in time. And, you know, parts of me are 3.5 billion years old. I have a lot of free will. It doesn't mean that I can change the laws of physics. So I couldn't, you know, make it so I was spontaneously in New York City this instant by, you know, snapping my fingers, but I can execute my free will over time by planning and be in free will, uh, you know, in New York tomorrow or the next day if I wanted to. Um, and so I think you have to think about what are the constraints and over what time scale do they operate? And elementary particles, you know, they are fully determined, <laughs> potentially. They have, a, you know, no free will, but they also don't have a structure that allows them to, to, you know, operate with configurations across time, which biological systems do. Um, so I don't think that life is reducible to its fundamental building blocks because the, the reducibility part is is removing time. And I think time is actually yeah. built into us as inf in, in information. And if we consider ourselves as being physical in time and having a physical size in space, um, time is where the space that actually allows us to execute free will, but we can't do it independent of the constraint yeah. that we the live The more in. complex organisms have more degrees of freedom than That's less right. complex organisms, right? And would that apply to consciousness as well? Instead of being a light switch, it's more like a, a rheostat or a, a dimmer that uh, you ratchet up or down, depending on I how, how many neurons you have or... I'm kind of on the fence on this one actually right now um, because I, it, part of me wants to say it's a very abrupt kind of transition like the origin of life is because, you know, I think about consciousness as being really about, um, about this evolutionary time or this assembly time, this causal structure that's embedded in, in our neural architecture, allowing us this abstract place to play in that's more temporal than spatial. Um, and, um, and so I can imagine that that space being as large as it is, is kind of an abrupt transition, um, just like the origin of life. But I also think in some ways that it might be much more gradual. Um, so I don't, I don't really, I haven't thought enough about the mechanism of that one that I would feel confident saying I have a formulation of exactly that problem yet that I could, I could answer that. Whereas with origin of life, I'm much more, more confident because we've worked out a lot of the mathematics of, of that transition. And we're just trying to figure out how to get it to be in a formulation that is more physically observable. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, consciousness, I thought about quite a lot and I think it has to do with this, this it's fact. It's hard that not the, to think about it because yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. you know, conscious. I am it, right. Yeah, no, that's right. <laughs> but I actually, you know, I, I think people also overrate, uh, I mean, I, I am very deeply appreciative of the fact I'm conscious, but I'm also deeply appreciative of the fact that most of my abstract thinking is in my unconscious mind. And, you know, what I, I, I really like, I, like I feel when I think about these things that my unconscious mind is doing most of the work. And that's like that moment of inspiration you have or something is like, you've really, you know, pushed a lot of your information processing to your unconscious mind. So I think, I think I would personally prefer to understand more about the relationship between the unconscious and conscious mind than just explaining consciousness itself. And I feel like people are just so fixated on experience and removing it from evolutionary time and just, and then, you know, panpsychists want to make it fundamental. And then you can't explain consciousness if it's the fundamental thing, because you've built nothing under it to explain it with. So, um, it's so turtles think, all the way down. <laughs> <laughs> it is turtles all the way down. But I think if you want to build a theory to explain something, you can't make that thing fundamental because you won't right. explain it. Right. Um, and this is something that people want to do all the time. They just want to say, the thing I'm studying is at the base of reality. And if you make it the base of reality, you're not studying that thing. You're studying things that that thing generates. Um, oh, I've been debating with Deepak and, and yeah. all these panpsychists for a while. I mean, they, the way they say it is, it's like um, consciousness is the ground of all being. Like, what does that mean? You know, it's like, yeah. how, do you, how, how do I get under that? You can't get underneath it. You can't. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be I would be fine with that if there was something that they wanted to predict about the non-conscious world mm. based on that, um, right? So because because the idea of making consciousness fundamental is you'll explain something. 
And you haven't explained what consciousness is except to say that it's fundamental. And you haven't used consciousness as a way to explain other features of reality. And I think you would need to, yeah. And so, you know, for me a, with life, it's like, um, sorry. Uh, I was just going to say, it's not a testable, ex it's a bad explanation. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's not, um, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a bad explanation because it's, it's not explaining anything. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. And I, I think, you know, my approach to life has been, I can't take, I, I actually wrote an essay years ago about life being fundamental. But what I meant by that was not that life itself is fundamental, but that there is some underlying missing physics that's fundamental that would allow us to explain the phenomena of life. Mm. And I think with consciousness, if you want to explain consciousness in terms of a fundamental principle, you would need to do the same thing. You would have to say there is something underlying consciousness that allows consciousness to exist in our universe. And I mm. think some of that structure in this kind of framing of new physics is related to the physics that we study in life and maybe related to the physics we study in assembly theory. I certainly like to think about it. But then for me, uh, consciousness emerges over lineages over time as specific kinds of objects become deeper and deeper in time. And so some things like us become conscious just because we have this large abstract space of information processing that's much more physical in time than space that we can access. And therefore, you know, like that's a feature of us. But, you know, like that has to le lead to testable consequences. And we are thinking right. about that. And I think most of the things about consciousness that might be testable are more collective properties, like the fact that human imagination can imagine rockets and build them over generations seems to me like a really interesting manifestation of what the human mind does. But you yeah. don't see a lot of people in that field talking about those kind of regularities right. that are much more physical in terms of how they want to talk about consciousness. It's much more about how we feel on the inside. And yeah, I right. want to know if how we feel on the inside has any consequences I can measure on the outside. <laughs> right. Well, this was my challenge to the ID people at that conference was, um, if everything you say is true, you know, that the ID or God steps in and stirs the particles <laughs> somehow to go from RNA to DNA or the protein synthesis or the bacterial flagellum, does he do this uh, like at every stage, <laughs> like for every organism? Yeah. Did he front load into the laws of nature this unfolding teleological development? Because if so, then how is it any different from, uh, you know, a naturalistic explanation they really had no they, they basically said that's not our job we're not trying to uh, well, explain that yeah i mean there's uh, that this goes back to the point about the, the fact and it was a little bit of a cheeky comment but there are there are theor theorists in intelligent design there are no experimentalists and you know part of the thing about having experiments is it requires a mechanism and yeah. so the theorists are not even working on mechanisms which suggests to me that they're at theory step one, which is I have an idea of an explanation, but not actually an explanation because yeah. they haven't embedded it in a mechanism. Yeah. All right. Give me a second to tee up the last question here as we sure. wind up. Um, okay. Let's apply the principle of uniformitarianism uh, mm -hmm. to assembly theory. The principle is that the laws of nature probably operate the same everywhere in the universe. So mm -hmm. assembly theory should operate in other uh, solar systems and planetary systems and galaxies and so on, yeah. uh, as along with the, the laws of evolution and physics and whatnot. Okay. So assuming the Copernican principle, we're not special, there should be cities all over the cosmos, right? You know, a trillion galaxies, each of which has hundreds of billions of stars, mm -hmm. each of which have planets and so on. And so you know the numbers. Um, okay, so should we be looking for things like Kar Kardashev scale, different levels of cities, Dyson spheres? Are, are we on the right track of looking for those kinds of things? Or do you think we need a completely different approach to looking for aliens? So I think it's good that we're out there looking, but again, I think it comes back to the fact that we don't know what we're looking for. So we're kind of going off of the idea that aliens are just going to be utterly obvious. Um, and so I do think that the, the physics governing life is universal and that the same physics should operate other places. But I think, you know, evolution, as we know on earth can generate all kinds of weird stuff. And if it had a completely different origin, we don't know how weird, you know, and how different from life has evolved on earth it could be. And without knowing a mechanism for the origin of life and a, a mechanism for predicting what kinds of other life are out there, you know, it's kind of hopeless. Like we just have to look for anomalies basically. Um, and anomalies don't equal alien. They just equal anomaly. And then we still have to come up with an explanation. So no matter what, we have to find an explanation for what aliens are. 
Um, and so for me, the, the fastest route to that is to do what science does best, which is work on theory and experiment. And so this is one of the reasons that I'm, I'm very adamant that the most successful route to finding alien life is to solve the origin of life in the lab and evolve from scratch a new life form that might have radically different chemistry than, than life as we know it. Because doing that will, or it might have the same chemistry. It might be fully contingent. I mean, we don't know, right? Um, but until we see that happen and we actually have a theory that explains what we see in the lab, I think we won't know how to predict what kinds of planets will generate life. Um, and what the sign like what will be the sort of properties of life on those planets? What kind of molecules will they have discovered? Um, and what kind of structures will they will they even be cellular? Um, and so, you know, people haven't thought about the search for alien life as an experimental program. Uh, but you know, people didn't think that the you know the search for origin of our universe could be an experimental program either. But most of the stuff that we've learned about the first few minutes of the universe has been by building large particle accelerators on Earth that have explored conditions of energy not seen since the, the earliest history of our universe. And that's, that's how we know so much about how cosmology works. And I think alien life, we've always just thought we're going to just find it out there or it's going to come visit us. But I think we have to do what we do as scientists and we have to really figure it out and test the ideas in the laboratory. And this requires building a planet simulator in some sense, like a big bang simulator. And we're really going to have to explore chemical space to look for life and try to do it under different geochemical conditions. You should set up a new biosphere in the desert. Like they had biosphere two, yeah. you should set up biosphere three. <laughs> biosphere three, the emergent one, the one that's actually yeah. starting from scratch. Yeah. Sarah, was, I forgot to ask you this at the very beginning while yeah. I always ask my guests this, what's your story? How'd you get into all this stuff? Oh, sure. Um, I, oh gosh, I don't, you know, I, um, I, my parents didn't go to university. And so when I was finishing high school, I decided just to go to the local community college. And, um, because I just like, I didn't, you know, the application process for university, very intimidating. I also had a job and everything else. So I went to the community college. I knew I liked science. So I just took all their science classes my first semester. And that's all I took. Um, but I, I absolutely love physics. I just loved it. I, I remember, uh, that physics class so vividly. And I think the thing that really struck me, um, was this, this particular lecture, the first week of class. And I, I still remember it like, like very, vi very visually. Um, I, you know, my professor was talking about magnetic monopoles and how we had theories of physics that predicted their existence, but we didn't know if they were out there. And, and you know, for anybody that has magnets, you know they have a north and south pole. And if you cut them in half, they still have a north and south pole. Um, so imagine seeing just a south or just a north. Like, it's something we can imagine, uh, but we've never observed it. And it wasn't just that we could imagine it. It was that we had theories that maybe predicted its existence, and they were important for cosmology. So I just thought that idea of having a like a human mind can come up with abstract theories of the world that, and go test whether they actually correspond to reality or not um, really sold me on physics as a discipline that I wanted to study. And then I went into undergrad at Florida Tech um, and I was doing particle physics experiments, like working on large hadron collider in a lab there uh, with Marcus Holman. And that was a lot of fun, but I really wanted to do theory. And like I played around a little bit with particle theory while I was there. But then I went to graduate school um, at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, and that's when I met my PhD advisor, Marcel Gleiser. And he was, you know, like, it was very funny because there were like 10 PhD students starting at the same time in a very tiny department. We only had 20 faculty. And eight of us, I think, wanted to work with the two cosmology professors. <laughs> so I was like, so Marcelo's like, I want someone to work on astrobiology. And I was like, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll do it. Because I wanted to be able to work on cosmology. And it was... Um, it was very, very funny because uh, I, you know, I started with this problem on on the origin of homochirality, you know, thinking about the origin of uh, why amino acids that are encoded in proteins are only um, left handed when they can come in a mirror image that's called right handed. And the same for uh, sugars in DNA and RNA, which are right handed. So this is like a symmetry breaking problem, a classic problem in physics. So I, I worked my PhD on that, but I kept thinking I was going to go back to like inflationary cosmology and all the other stuff. Um, but then I realized like the reason I got in science was because of this fundamental idea that we could build new theories and test them. And I wasn't really feeling like I was generating new ideas and like really pushing the frontier and origins of life. Like nobody knew what was going on. <laughs> and I just found that so incredibly exciting. So that's why I started working on it was really because I wanted to do what theoretical physicists had done in all my textbooks, which was 
you know, come up with really deep new insights. But I think the place to do that is in the areas where we don't have those yet. And so Origin of Life to me seemed like the problem to answer now. Um, and so that's why I'm so excited about it. And that's also one of the reasons I wrote the book was just to get people changing their mind about how they think about the problem and getting people to think about it more concretely and scientifically as far as the possibilities, you know, to the point of, you know, like, people don't think to look for alien life in the lab, but like, why would you think about doing that? But if you have a, a good theoretical explanatory paradigm, it becomes a tractable problem and we just need to invest in that area. Sarah, what an incredible story. Very contingent life uh, <laughs> pathway, but yep. that's true for most people. I, I think most, pe most lives as they turn out and unfold are along the lines of Jorge Borges novel, um, the, P the Garden of Forking Paths. Uh, yeah. You know, if you go down enough forked paths, it's unpredictable. You know, you mm -hmm. went left instead of right. You did this instead of that. You met this professor instead of that professor. This, you know, everybody was doing this, so I did that. And here you are. I mean, who yeah. would have predicted it? No, I couldn't even. I had no idea. <laughs> <laughs> What's the story of Amari? What's your middle name? Is oh, that a, is my middle a... <laughs> name. Yeah, that's very funny because my mother is an antique dealer and she does like interior design stuff. And she absolutely loves... Um, Amari dishes, oh. uh, which were imported to the United States from Japan in the 1800s. And if you've ever seen them, they have like a really be beautiful characteristic floral pattern on them. They're often orange and blue, but sometimes they're blue. Um, and so she named me Amari thinking Amari was the Japanese word for flower. So like my middle name was supposed to mean flower, but I didn't, ch I didn't look until much later. And actually it was when I was visiting Japan for work. I just never thought to like question that, that like Amari is actually, uh, the name of the port in Japan that they exported those dishes from. And, and so, so I'm actually named after a port in Japan, but I actually <laughs> named funny. after the dishes and they're really beautiful, but it's kind of a, it's kind of a funny <laughs> That's story. Great. Um, <laughs> That's great. All right. There it is. Life as no one knows it. Yeah. It's a paradigm shifting book. I hope it does well. I hope your career uh, continues solving these problems. This is, this is, this is a great challenge. Good luck to you. Yeah. Thanks so much.